This was years ago, back when me and a group of close friends were all about 17 to 19. Some of us drove and others did not. To add some quick background, I've never experienced something like this before and typically did not believe in the paranormal. I haven't experienced anything strange in the woods since and I've continued to hunt and track and spend time outdoors. I have no explanation for the events that would occur on this night. On an August evening, a group of friends and I were sleeping in a small cabin out in the woods. The cabin was very old and run down, but was the only shelter from the weather. The cabin was actually owned by my best friend's father who had the place for years and years, but was too lazy to do the proper upkeeping on it. Sure, it did the job, but it desperately needed some much love and TLC. The night started out like any other. We were sitting around the fire and telling stories. I can still remember the feeling of the fire. It was so warm and comforting. I thought nothing of it at the time, though. Anyway, we all go inside shortly thereafter, and around 9 p.m., the group of us went to bed. We were due to go scouting for good spots for deer stands the next day and really wanted to get a good night of sleep. We were all very tired, so nobody was alarmed at the fact that we all went to sleep at the same time. After all, the drive up here was three hours, and I'm sure you know just how taxing long car rides can be mentally. Then, we didn't sleep so peacefully after that. One hour later, something had happened. I was awoken by a loud thud coming from the kitchen, followed by a scream. I immediately jumped from my bed and ran toward the kitchen. The rest of the group did the same as we were all awakened and terrified as what was now happening, whatever this was. My best friend and his father were in the kitchen and both of them looked like they were terrified, staring wildly out the door. Sometimes my friend's father would drop early in the morning and crash out in the main room, so it wasn't a surprise to see him here. We all asked both of them what was wrong and why they were screaming. Soon after, I heard, no, we heard the sound of something coming from the roof. All of us in unison turn our attention to the roof and we can hear something very large walking across the cabin roof. Then, it, whatever it was, let out this terrifying screech and I remember the exact sound as it was like a howl screeching, only ten times louder. The screech was so loud and piercing, it hurt my ears, and I remember I had to cover them with my hands because it was painstaking. The screech was also very deep in pitch, and sounded like you took an owl and were choking the life out of it to get that noise. It was horrible. I can remember just looking at my friends and my friend's father and we all had the same face of terror. Somebody says, what the hell is that? While somebody else asked, is that a Bigfoot? Then, the screeching stopped and we heard this loud thud, dropping from the roof, hitting the ground on the side of the cabin. It sounded like whatever weighed about 500 pounds dropped to the ground. It was heavy, but the screech continued on for another minute. And then, it was silent. I remember having to force myself to leave the safety of the kitchen and walk out into the main foyer. I remember the cold and the moonlight shining in through the windows of the cabin. I remember the cold feeling in my body. Picture this. Be inside the middle of a horror movie and just try to imagine how that feels. I think I could speak for all of us when we were overcome with dread and fear. After it went completely silent, my friend's dad opens the front door and shines his light out to look. And you could hear the night outside was so quiet. There was no crickets, no noise, no nothing. And keep in mind, this was in late summer. The forest is usually pretty alive at night. Crickets and sounds of nightlife. It was incredibly eerie and we all had this lingering feeling like something really bad was going to happen. One of our friends, maybe in a moment of craziness or what suggested we all go outside together to 
find the source of that noise. And when I think most of us screamed at him, are you crazy? I mean, even my friend's dad had a very concerned look on his face. He kept pacing back and forth, just saying, this isn't good. No, 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 th this isn't good. Trying his best to keep us calm and in the cabin. He told us we all need to wait it out until morning and we're going to have to cancel our hunting trip or our deer stand hunting trip, I should say. I don't know if he was more scared than we were, but his reaction was to force us to stay in the cabin until morning light. One of the friends in the group, maybe the craziest of all of us, decided that he was going to bravely go outside and look around in the dark to try and find the source of that noise. Apparently, he was convinced that this was nonsense and he was going to prove it. He had one of those high lumen flashlights. I tried. We all tried. We begged him not to go, but he was having none of it. So he frantically runs out the cabin like a madman, thinking he's going to be the Indiana Jones and be a hero and prove to us that it was nothing. Well, less than five minutes, he comes running back in the cabin, slamming the door shut, and he's screaming and pale as a ghost. He keeps saying really fast, there's something outside, it's so big, and it, it's walking around, I saw it. And he's pale, more pale than you'll ever get if you're sick. My friend's dad tried to comfort him to the best of his ability and redirect him to one of the small rooms in the cabin to try and further calm him down. We just kept the door locked that night and did our best to sleep, while others thought it would be best to stay up and keep watch. The rest of the night wasn't as eventful, but me, among a couple others who decided to stay up, kept hearing something really big walking around the cabin out in the dark. We were all too terrified to even dare shine our flashlights out there at whatever it was walking around. It honestly reminded me of the film Jeepers Creepers, honestly. It crept me out. I have no idea how many other friends even managed to get any sleep, but somehow they pulled it off. My friend's dad was among us who stayed up all night and was with me to help keep watch and make sure that we were all safe. Now, as soon as about 5 a.m. hits and it was light enough, we all promptly grab our stuff and without much conversation at all, loaded up our car and off we went. We also woke the ones who were asleep, so don't worry, we didn't leave them behind, but we didn't want to waste any unnecessary time in that cabin more than we had to. This is where things get creepy, as if they aren't already. My friend's dad drove back in his car, and we drove and followed him. He told us that he would meet us all back at their house, since that's where we all met up the day before to load up and go. The three hours plus back seemed like a blur of time. Thoughts of the previous night would not stop replaying in my mind. We get back to the house, began unloading our stuff, getting ready to go into our separate vehicles and so I start asking my friend's dad what he thinks it was. Was it a cougar? A Bigfoot? I mean honestly, what did we experience last night? He seemed very hesitant to talk about it, but after some more prying, I got him to open up. He began telling us how he's ran into it before and he knows what it is. Then. He asks us a very serious question, more serious than I have ever seen him in my life. Have you guys ever heard of a Wendigo? We had not. He explained to us further that it's some cannibalistic spirit that has taken the physical form and will stalk you if it finds you. One time, about four or five years ago, he was hunting up by the cabin and he felt like he ventured a little too far to the west. where this thing's territory must have been, and claims that it followed him back to the same cabin where we were staying. It's like it had our scent and was waiting for us to come back to that cabin to show ourselves. Even just typing this out gives me the creeps. I can't stop reliving it. I'm not sure why it never tried to get into the cabin, but who knows. Maybe it would have stayed longer. Maybe it was looking for weak points. We're not sure. Who knows? Maybe is all I could ever ask. Anyway, believe me or not, that's what I experienced.
It happened in May of 2008. I was camping in the Rocky Mountains of Alberta with my family and friends. There were about 20 of us in total in a place called Banff National Park. We were driven out of our campsite by some sort of animal. We suspect a bear and we ended up in a place called Johnston Canyon. This was in the middle of the night and there was a windstorm going on. The wind was howling and it was raining, although lightly. There was some thunder and lightning on in the background, but not too much. My friend and I were sharing a tent, and at about 3 o'clock in the morning, we hear a noise that sounded like something walking around outside the tent. My friend told me to turn on my headlamp, so I did. I shone the light out of the tent, and I saw something moving around with the corner of my eye. I quickly turned my headlamp on it, and it startled and scared the living daylights out of me. It, whatever it was, was about eight feet tall, covered from head to toe in long, black, matted, nasty hair. It had these hollow, empty eyes that kind of glowed a dull yellow, and they illuminated from the light of the handland. It was staring at me. I tried to scream, but this thing was so ugly. It had a face that stuck out like a deer or maybe a dog, and even kind of had small little horns protruding on top of its head. Not like full-blown antlers, like a eight or nine or ten rack deer would have, but this was more like little horns that you'd see a male buck having, like a little one. The face resembles more of a rotting skull with bits of tissue falling off it. I wouldn't notice though until afterwards, but this horrible odor of rotting meat lingered around our campsite for hours after the event. Once I shined my light into its face, it quickly lifted up its arm as if to shield its face from any kind of light and kind of faded off into the obscurity of the darkness of the night. Either that or I turned away out of sheer terror and began screaming. My friend and I both saw it and my behavior woke up pretty much everybody else. And so they're screaming at me through their tents What's going on? What did you see? What's wrong? I told them right then and there, guys, there's something walking around our campsite that isn't an animal, and it's not human. I don't know what it was, but it scared me badly. After this, the rain came down pretty heavily. And so now, we all just stayed put in our tents. Many of us went back to sleep, but my friend decided that we should try and stay up maybe keep an eye out in case this thing comes back. I did not have a weapon on me. I know, stupid, right? But my friend kept a Colt 45 with him at all times. He was always and still is a firm believer that if you're going to be hiking or out in the wilderness, you need to carry a powerful weapon in case you run into a dangerous situation and desperately need it. It seemed like after that thing left, The rain and storm intensified, as if its mere presence angered the storm. At some point in the morning, I passed out from sheer exhaustion and woke up sometime in the early a.m. I think I was the first one up, and so I woke everybody, explaining we need to move now and not stick around in case whatever that thing was decides to come back. I'm glad my friends stuck up for me and convinced my family and friends that I saw something, and that it's also verifiable and was not just a mistaken identity. They were convinced I saw something, although not sure what. We loaded up, packed out of there as quickly as we could. Now, moving forward in time, a little bit, I kind of forgot about the whole event, until months later. This same family friend and I are sitting down over a beer, and he brings up the time we saw that thing camping. I immediately remembered and had flashbacks to it. It scared me to even think about. He explained to me, yeah, I tried to do some research on what I think we saw. I'm pretty sure it's no Bigfoot. Did not look or act like one. It had to have been a Wendigo. To further tie things in, I recently found your channel and was reminded of this event again by the same friend telling me I should reach out to you for verification. Is this a Wendigo we saw, or something else?
Me and my brother were hunting back in the foothills of Ohio when we found ourselves in a rather large, small cave. Driven by curiosity, we were no seasoned spelunkers, nor did we have the proper equipment to safely explore deeper. But we didn't care. We were young, on a thrill ride mission. So let me explain to you how the cave looked. We were on a steep incline down a bunch of rocks, down to this cave opening which was very large, but kind of bled into a smaller tunnel, which is why I say it was a small large cave. It had a strange smell emanating from the cave, and the further down we got, the more terror we could sense. As we neared the bottom of this steep incline, my brother points to me and says, look at this, and to my horror, all along the bottom, where there were no rocks and it was flat, there were dead birds, like everywhere, all in varying states of decay, some freshly dead, some completely rotted and skeletal, while others were in the process somewhere in between of rotting. You can just imagine the smell was just lovely. As we're trying to put together the pieces, why are there so many dead birds down here? It doesn't look like anything killed them. It looks like they just fell out of the sky and died here. We get this really bad feeling, like something is watching us from inside this cave. We should not continue onward. So we immediately turn around and start making our way back up. And as we do, the feeling does not lessen. It gets stronger and stronger. And so now we're moving faster and faster. And we get up the incline and we don't dare look back until we get well out of the opening or the mouth of the cave. We get back up to the top of this incline and we both sense something dangerous is down there. We can both know it. We both feel it. And we're spooked. We're experienced outdoorsmen and woodsmen, so we know our way around. We're not amateurs, but we felt and know something was watching us. We should have never went down there. We turn around to look back into the cave, and as we do, this enormous hulking shadow appears in the opening. We both say to each other at the same time, what the hell is that? As we watched in amazement, this humanoid shadow seemed to stretch and grow its arms and head reaching out. Then it stops. It stands still at the opening, its body still hidden in the darkness. It's completely motionless and silent. We feel its body watching us. Then it starts to make a sound. It's a haunting, long, deep howl. It's guttural and coarse, and it carries deep into the air. It's a low moaning growl like a wild animal would make and it gets louder and louder, until it's louder than our own voices, just like we were talking. It's so loud now that it's echoing off the mountainside, balancing across the hills. It's the most terrifying howl I've ever heard. It's like a wailing howl of pure desperation and hunger. There's something about it that's just so compelling and so very wrong. I can't even begin to describe how it sounded. It's something you have to hear for yourself. As it's echoing out this horrendous howl, me and my brother don't need any more time to decide that we need to get as far away from here as humanly possible. Let's just say we cut our day short, and we still talk about that day even now. It was hands down the scariest thing I've ever dealt with while in the thick of the woods. This was just last summer, in 2020. One summer night, my friend and I are sitting around a bonfire with other friends and noticed a strange, pale, and gaunt figure staring at us through the trees beyond. We didn't think much of it, as it looked somewhat human. We assumed it was some kid or young adult who perhaps had been drinking and stumbled into our campground. We ignored the figure for a while, but it kept staring at us. It was not particularly tall, but was very thin. It was wearing what appeared to be a torn dark brown robe, and it had pale white skin with very long, dirty, stringing black hair hanging from its face. It had no facial features that we could see at the distance. At least, that may not stand out as alarming, as I'm probably making it sound. But that was at first. After a while, the figure disappeared from the trees, and my friend and I 
since we were the closest to the wood line, could hear something moving quickly in the woods coming in our direction. This made us both incredibly uneasy, as it would anybody. Quick note, this is where I have to insert a disclaimer that I'm not suggesting that what I saw was a Wendigo in fact. Also, I'm not trying to make a mockery of the idea of the Wendigo either. I merely want to share my own experience. I realize there's a lot of controversy surrounding the idea of Wendigos. If you don't believe in them, that's perfectly fine. I'm not trying to change anyone's mind. Just share my story and be done with it. I have to tell you, this is the point in the story where I begin to question my own sanity. The next thing we knew, we can hear it behind us, and we both turn, and all of us around the bonfire now see this thing in full. The figure had appeared, and it was now very tall, at least eight feet. Its hair was longer than we thought, very long, and it had very sunken in features, emaciated and sickly looking. It clearly was not human at least any that I'd ever seen, and it just stood there at the tree line, observing, watching. Several of us began screaming, running back towards the camp, while the others of us were downright frozen where we were standing. I do not know what my friend and I were doing. We were stuck in a state of perpetual shock. I remember turning and running, being so afraid that I was going to fall and this thing was going to grab me. I did not see or feel anyone behind me, but I only made it as far as the fire pit, and I stopped and turned to see what it was doing. It, to my horror, had begun running towards me, and was now very much taller and larger than I ever thought. It had singled me out and was charging me. I remember looking up at it when it was no more than a few feet away, and in that exact moment, it looked at me with these lifeless eyes, and somehow, I don't know, like some sort of paranormal phenomenon. Its face had contorted and changed. It had no face. It was just a black void with eyes. I can't even begin to explain. I screamed and fell to the ground. I think my friend was screaming too, but it's a blur, to be honest. I don't remember. The next thing I do remember, I was sitting on the ground, looking at my own hands, covered in dirt and blood. When I look up, I was surprised to see my friend next to me, and he's looking around like crazy, trying to get me to go now before this thing comes back. I think I must have blacked out for a moment or two because it's like my brain just lapsed that moment of time completely out of my memory, just like a voided check. We were all 15 or 16 at the time, so we make it back to camp. Everybody's freaking out, crying, telling our parents what we had seen. They listened and tried their best calming everybody down, trying to prove there's nothing spooky out in the woods. We have no reason to fear, and probably just saw a deer. But I tried convincing them, or at least I tried, that there was something there. We all saw it, and there's no denying that. They weren't really buying it, so I just gave up after a while and kept it to myself. I know it might sound very strange, and I want you to bear with me, through these feelings, but I strongly feel that whatever I saw that night somehow attached itself to me or marked me in some way. I don't know how to explain or describe my feelings. It's like it marked me. I feel different. Not just about my sighting, but I physically feel different. Like this thing is a part of me now. I haven't felt right ever since this happened and I don't know who I can talk to about it to be honest. My parents and family don't want to hear about it, and my friends listen to me, but there's not much they can do. Understandably so. What do you think happened? Can you provide me with some answers? Thank you. So, to give context, I didn't believe in Wendigos or anything supernatural like that growing up, due to my upbringing as a Jehovah's Witness. I didn't scare easily, save especially when it came to dark, until that one morning. I was about 10 when my parents wanted me to visit my uncle for a couple of weeks in the winter and help him around his property. I of course complied just moments after the promise of Otter Pops and chilling out with my uncle. 
My uncle's house was wedged between Madras and Warm Springs, and he had a couple of neighbors just within earshot of the property. So, it wasn't entirely isolated. But I hadn't realized that I'd get stuck with the chore of throwing a couple of flakes of hay to his horses every morning after the first couple days. And so by morning, it was more or less a bit before six, and it was very dark. So, the fifth morning, I come out to fling hay over the fences, and I get spooked by the scent of geese flopping about. I had to take a quick pause and gather myself as I continued to distribute the hay. Weirdly enough, I noticed the horses had not come any closer to munch the hay that they usually whine for. They just stayed huddled together in the shed, making it impossible to tell which is the other. Then, to my delayed horror, I noticed one of the two horses came galloping over from the other side of the area to prey upon the hay that usually they consume with much glee. I looked back at the shed as the horses began moving together. It didn't feel any way natural to see two horses moving so forcedly like that. It was a good enough reason to book it out of there already, but me and my dense school had already decided to throw the last two flakes before booking it back to the house. Then, the frozen morning dew being crushed inside the pen had already caught my gaze, and I felt like my heart had stopped. I had witnessed the two horses huddled together, twisting in such a way that they were sprinting as one thing towards me, and before I knew it, my legs were now making a full sprint to the back door of the house. I kept hearing the sounds of not Broncos galloping, but the thumping of hands or feet, crushing the frozen cheatgrass. I'd like to know what you guys think, and what this could have been. I mean, this may have been something I've never dealt with before. It has been a decade now since, and I still hear that noise in my nightmares. What should I do? I was seven years old, which is not too long ago. I had a habit of talking to myself while walking around outside. In fact, I could spend all day outside, or even stay outside all night, without ever getting scared or anything, until this one day. I was walking outside doing my everyday thing, the entire property was covered in woodlands surrounding the house and the long driveway that leads to the road. Nothing but giant woods, actually. And the woods were so big, you can go to the top of the driveway, look at the overview of the woods, just extending miles and miles out. When I was going to the side of the house to the door that leads underneath the house, I heard walking and crying. So naturally, I walked over to where it was, shining my flashlight at the noises, and I wish I would have immediately ran, hearing those noises, then looking at the thing. What I saw was easily the most terrifying thing I've ever seen in my life. The thing was a bluish pale, with a greenish-white glowing eyes. It was as tall as a doorway, the skin stretching so tight over the thing that I could see the veins and bones. The hands were the size of a dinner plate, and the fingers very bony and long. Its face was behind a bush, so I couldn't see it well, but I could make out a little. It began moving its head around, trying to look at me. The way it moved around unsettled me so bad, so I just stood still in fear trying to process what was looking at me. It stopped moving, and it crouched down like a frog, getting ready to hop. The face of this thing is what unsettled me the most. Its face had an angry, I mean really angry expression, and the teeth were sharp. It had more teeth than I can honestly count. Long, sharp teeth, big, bulging, glowing eyes, angry expression, and no nose, just two small holes 
It was the perfect combination of a face, of a creature, you should never mess with. I screamed so loud it was kind of scared by me, but still seemed interested in what I thought was it wanting to disembowel me. I ran to the back porch, which was pretty far away, but I was determined. I ran faster than normal, and I was already out of breath. But having a very sore cramp is way more better than being torn apart. I ran onto the back porch, busting through the door, slamming it shut. The first thing I did was lock it, run to my room, cry, and cower under my bed, staying up all night, and never going outside again at night after that. Look, I've never seen the thing ever again, but I can't go outside alone in the day. But at night, <laughs> no one unless the entire military guarding the perimeter would make me do that. My parents did not buy my story. But my brother? Well, he's crazy when a subject comes to Wendigos, and he believes me. Honestly, I don't know if it's a crawler or a Wendigo or what. Please, help me. Help me understand what I saw. To preface, I was born and raised in Arizona, and I am very mindful and fascinated by the general Navajo culture. I do not speak on skinwalkers often, out of respect for the very real fear and activity that's highly cultivated by discussing them. Anyway, on to the story. I live in an apartment with my roommate. We're not religious. Actually, we're both ex-Catholic, but are very into spirituality in the spiritual realm. She's been struggling with rejecting toxic and parasitic people in her life, and was actually in a deep meditation before basically falling asleep, reflecting on how to expel intrusive thoughts caused by hateful people. She sees two entities while in this meditation, went to sleep, wakes up around midnight in a sleep paralysis to see a black entity in her room staring at her. Now, on my side of the apartment, I didn't know what was going on or any of this was even happening. So I fell asleep around 11.30, slipped into a lucid dream paralysis-like state, which is not really common for me. My room looked exactly the same as it did when I fell asleep. In the dream, my roommate opens the door, sits on my bed to try and soothe me during this paralysis. But as she was talking, I shortly realized her voice sounded wrong. It was all choppy and robotic. It was either an entity posing as her, or it had taken total control of her body. Then this thing tried to enter me by pretending to touch my face in some false, soothing manner. I could feel its fingers trying to force their way into my mouth. I was inclined to bite, but I knew I was in danger, and I was scared because it was still her body. I mean, I didn't want to hurt her hand. As soon as I felt it start to get into my mouth, I was literally shot out of the dream and instantaneously wide awake. We think the pervasive thoughts she's been experiencing for so long from toxic situations was actually cast out of her and looking for a new host. But I wouldn't accept it because of how in tune I am with her and just a general growth in confidence and awareness. Look, I know this seems crazy, but this could have been some other type of entity. I'm not sure. After much reflecting... I felt like what everybody else describes as skinwalkers, but it did seem slightly less sinister. I don't know. Almost a weak attempt at imitating my roommate to take some kind of life force from me. Shapeshifter, skinwalker, entity. I don't know. We're reeling a bit, but honestly, any thoughts are much appreciated.
I'm 37, 36 at the time of this encounter, and have always been interested in things like the paranormal. I've actually had a couple of encounters and experiences that don't quite fit into the shapeshifter skinwalker bubble, so I'll talk about those elsewhere. I would just like to backtrack for a moment and emphasize that, quote unquote, interested in the paranormal does not mean an outright believer. I mean, I'm certainly open to it, but more often than not, I'll enter a situation with a very agnostic attitude and instantly develop one of skepticism once I begin assessing and getting a chance to evaluate everything. That being said, I do live a good mystery, and don't think for a moment that people who believe in such things are lying or possibly stupid. We all have our reasons for believing what we do. I tried sending this through voicemail to Monsters Among Us a while ago, but I don't think it ever got aired. Anyway, enough backstory. Let's get to the story. I was working one and a half jobs in 2019. The half job was an on-call assistant private investigator, and my main full-time job was a security guard. We mainly did patrols for apartments and a small handful of residential contracts. This particular event took place at 19th Avenue and Camelback, which, if you're from Phoenix, you know is a pretty shady part of town. The apartments I patrolled were just south of there. They were predominantly low-income tenants, half of whom were who were refugees all over the globe. The complex was well known in the area for things like theft, violence, break-ins, drug dealing, gang banging, and so on. I liked patrolling it because I felt like I was helping people who genuinely needed it, and the vast majority of them were very grateful that I was there. I got to know many of them very well, and so we would often talk and shoot the breeze before I got any chance to start making my rounds again. One of the people I would talk to was an older native guy, who I won't name for obvious reasons. Often, he was on his balcony, getting drunk and high. Things which we were supposed to report, but whatever. As long as you weren't causing any trouble, or making too much disturbance, I'm not saying anything. I would usually say hi, he would say hi to me, and I arrived on post. We'd talk for a while, then I'd begin my shift. You know, I never had any real issues with the guy. He just liked listening to music, having a couple beers, and maybe having a blunt or two. Seemed like a pretty genuinely nice guy. He even had a tattoo on his chest of some Kachina doll, though I have no idea if they play into this encounter or not. Anyway, in the summer of 2019, I was doing my rounds, and right around 8.30pm, I hear him chanting loudly in his native language. I went to see if he was okay, as he never did this before. When I get there, he was inside, so I kept doing my patrol until I heard it again not long after. I went back inside, or back to the side of the complex where he was and saw him, his pregnant fiancé, and his son, whom I had never met before, all coming down the stairs. He looked at me and said, Hey, follow me. When I was walking behind them, I saw what appeared to be a giant-looking knife in the son's hand. But when we get to the parking lot, I could see it was just a very large feather, and his father had two smaller ones maybe from a juvenile eagle. When we entered the parking lot, I saw a native woman standing there who I had kicked out earlier for being too loud and yelling at a guy who was the roommate of the native tenant. I had seen him before and knew he lived there, but didn't know he was his roommate. You know, I don't remember what they were arguing about, at least this time, but she had her two sons with her, a 10-year-old boy 
and a six-month-old baby in a stroller. They were going back and forth with each other, and the father and son began taking the feathers, rubbing them on the children's faces, while whispering in their language. The mother begins flipping out. Don't you put that on my babies. You sicko. Get away. And so on. I was about to step in and tell them that they need to stop, when they both stood up and said in a very guilty voice, We aren't doing anything to hurt the baby. That's why I even brought the security guard, just to make sure everything is okay. And she replied, He doesn't even know what's going on. Truer words could have never been spoken. So she then says this, If you guys aren't doing anything wrong, then do it on your pregnant fiancé's belly. The dad just says, okay, turns to his son to whisper something in his ear. Now the kids turn to flip out, and he yells, You're still evil. I'm half Christian, and I'm not doing this evil stuff, etc., etc., and takes off running. The dad and his fiancé yelled at him to come back. Then he takes off after him. I'm stuck there, trying to get the lady with the kids to leave, now for their own safety. Then I ran off looking for the dad and son. I didn't find them, so just assumed they had left the property, and therefore weren't my problem any longer. Not long after, I see a fresh blood trail and vomit on the sidewalk, and a knife nearby it. Walked back to the native guy's balcony, where I can now see him getting bandaged up, by his fiancée, due to having a huge gash on his forehead. I called the cops. I mean, I hated doing that now, but this had turned serious. They came, I explained everything that had happened, and they knocked on his door, and of course, there was no answer. They explained to me there was nothing they could do, since this appeared to be a family issue, and the dad was attacked, didn't want to talk to them which, I mean, it makes sense, I suppose from their point of view. So, no charges were ever filed. The next day, I speak with the manager about the incident. He tells me, Oh, you mean Mike. Obviously not his real name. Man, I've been keeping an eye on him. He moved here after he got let out of prison for manslaughter. If any of you are familiar with the process of becoming a skinwalker, you would know that one of the big steps to take in order to become one involves the murder of a family member. I only saw the guy a few times afterwards, and we never done of the incident again. But it was always in the back of my mind, whenever I saw him. For the record, I don't personally think people can turn into coyotes, or wield magical powers, and no disrespect intended to anyone. However, I do think that some people think they are capable of such things. Anyway, if someone who is more knowledgeable about these things has any ideas, I would love to hear them. Particularly about the feathers and the tattoos. I knew a native guy years ago who had a specific tattoo put on him by a family member in case he ever got into prison so he could not be recruited by the warrior society which is a native prison gang. Think their version of the Aryan Brotherhood, and always wondered if they had any hand in the whole skinwalker thing in the Southwest. I was relaxing in my bedroom, playing some video games, when I hear this howling outside my window. This is fairly average for me because I live in a bit of a secluded area, that's near a city, but far enough away that wild animals are around me. But what made this time different was the howling seemed a bit distorted, if that makes sense. It just sounded weird. That was enough for me to look out my window. At first, I see nothing. But when I turn on the lights outside, automatically turned on if I press a button on my phone, I see a wolf or coyote standing on its back legs, with its fronts in the air. I watched for a few moments while this thing kind of walked around a bit and howled some more. At this point, I freak out, 
lock all the doors in the house and called my mom and dad, who were out of the house that particular night, shopping or something. So they immediately come home and I explain what had happened. They call the police and report a potential burglar or stalker. When they hang up, I try and convince them that that's what it actually was. But of course, in the end, they don't end up believing me. So my question for you is, what do skinwalkers generally look like? Secondly, how can I prevent a skinwalker coming near or to my house again? And third, what do I do if I see one of these things again? This took place a few years ago. I was in my late teens, driving home at around 10 p.m. This was a typical shift for me, and I was not too tired. I know what I saw. I lived somewhat out in the country, far enough to be on septic, close enough to be on the county's water system. I mean, it wasn't irregular to see wildlife at night, like elk, barn cats, deer, even occasionally dogs. I had been living here for a few years at this point, and during this time, one particular neighbor had this really bad habit of his dog running free on the side of the road. So, I love animals. I would always pull over, call the number on his collar, and get him back to his rightful owner. So, anyway, I'm driving home, nearly one block and three turns from my house. I see this figure out of the corner of my eye. It looks like a medium-sized dog. I roll down my window, and turn my music down, and start calling out to it as I would a dog. Hey, come here, sweetie. Come here, baby. It seemed very shy, as it refused to look at me, and its body language was very timid. I kept trying to speak sweetly to it, let it know that I was in no way a threat. It looked a little skinny, seemed to have short gray hair. I really wanted to see if I could help it, maybe find its owner, or get it somewhere safe and fed. It finally responds to my sweet talking, turns to face me, and my stomach drops. This is going to sound crazy, but it had a human face. The best way I could describe it is like a Teletubby. You know, I really wish there was another way to describe it, for the sake of my credibility. But it had no distinctive features, and its head was still shaped like a dog. It did not make any faces, any noises, and it did not speak, either. I was so surprised that I screamed and I sped off. I was so scared, too, because my house had a gate that I had to open, and I didn't know if it was following me or anything. I didn't look back, and it didn't appear to chase after me as I was speeding off. I feel bad about it to this day, and I wish I didn't react the way I did. But I didn't know if I was in danger. Seeing something like that, something that you just can't explain, I don't know. I really can't stress enough how it did not make any facial expressions. Noises or speech. Anything. I was the one going out of my way to bug it. And I was bluntly rude to it. I haven't seen it since. I wish I could change how I reacted. And I really do wonder about that all the time. So I did some internet scavenging afterwards. I haven't been able to find any experiences like it. Which now makes me feel even more nuts. Maybe it was something slightly different than a skinwalker, but this is the closest lore of it that I know of. If you've had any similar experiences, I have a ton of questions. Circa 2012, I was in combat training with the Marine Corps in Southern California on Firewatch one night, roughly 2 a.m., with two Navajo guys. We were on the subject of skinwalkers, telling stories that our grandparents or others had told us. We were all generally feeling a little creeped out, 
just from the atmosphere and the stories. When we hear the most distorted coyote howl any of us have ever heard, and what we could guess was about 50 yards away. It was like someone was slowing down a vinyl recording of a coyote howl with their finger. We all froze and were now stark white. We stared at each other for a bit, sweating. We finally pointed our flashlights in the direction of this distorted howl, and we all saw what looked like a coyote head sitting on a fence post. So here we are, just staring at it, in the shaky lights, absolutely silent. The head was pointed in our direction. Its eyes were open, but they didn't shine. They were just black. Finally, I say, maybe somebody found a dead coyote and put its head on the post. Sometimes, farmers will hang a dead coyote on a fence to keep other coyotes away. Our training was taking place on a large open cattle field, after all. And right after I say that, the head turns slightly to the left and moves off the post. From behind the post, this coyote walks out on its hind legs, its jaw and tongue dangling like they were broken, and then just walks off into the darkness, beyond the reach of our flashlights. We all immediately poop bricks, and we book it out of there, where everybody was sleeping, and of course proceeded to not sleep properly for the rest of our time out there. I mean, how could you? I'm telling you now, though, all three of us saw it, and all three of us know exactly what we saw. Moral of the story, speak about it, and they appear. I don't really know how to start this. It's my first one. At the time of writing this, I'm living in western Pennsylvania, a little south of Pittsburgh. I was in Boy Scouts for most of my life, so I feel very comfortable in the woods, and I often go camping. Upon hearing Governor Wolf's school closure plan, I decided that it was time for some cold weather camping. It was March. It wasn't that cold, but it did drop to 40 degrees at night, and the people who I went were not really avid campers. If you're from Pittsburgh, you may know the Boggs campsite on the Montour Trail. Well, that's where we went. They, of course, only brought weed and alcohol, did not bring any sleeping bags, blankets, or pillows. So, naturally, I assumed they were going to have sit by a fire all night. It was light when we first got there, and the fire pit was still smoldering. Very cool. We used the coals from the previous camper's fire to light ours. Immediately, I knew that I would have to provide wood for the fire until I went to bed. They passed out beers at around 3 p.m. The times are going to be a bit dodgy. I was not near my phone. After having two to three, I just honestly wanted dinner. Now that they did for me, they made ramen noodles and cheese, which was amazing and burgers over the fire. By this time, it would have been close to 5 p.m. It began to rain just a little bit, as was forecasted. So we took shelter in the lean-to shelter that was on site, and occasionally, one of them would throw some sticks on the fire. The sticks were all they seemed to be able to find, even though I brought two saws and an axe. I would cut up some logs. By the time the rain stopped, all four of us smoked and were sitting around the fire. I was light out, so we'll call it seven. After a while of just hanging around, they asked if I had any blankets. I always have blankets. Nothing special, but we've had some pretty bad snowstorms in the past, and a couple of scratchy car blankets are always useful. They each got a blanket, except for R, as we'll call him who got my summer sleeping bag that I brought just in case. By now, it was dark, around 9 or 9.30 p.m., and the fire was getting low. 
I start off to find some more wood, because they wanted to smoke more. Now, it's important to know that I'm 6'5", and a semi-frequent user of weed, so my tolerance is pretty high. I return with the wood, and we spark up another one, a smaller one, just to kind of hang out, talk, listen to music, good times. Eventually the fire again dies down a little bit, and again, it's my job to get more wood. Because we had been there for a while, there were people there before us. Most of the wood near the shelter was either really small or all used up. So I had to keep going farther and farther away from camp to find wood. About 12.30 a.m., close to 50 degrees, so we're all doing well. I got a flashlight, a really nice one that I used for scuba diving. That is also kind of bright, so I use it on the low setting on land. At this point, I'm far enough away from camp that my friends cannot really see me, and there's like an embankment between the Montour Trail and someone's driveway that you have to cross to get to more woods. But I'm comfortable alone because I knew what I was doing, and they could hear if I needed them. I start to hear a weird whistling sound, kind of like somebody inhaling through a snorkel, but I believe it's just the wind. The air was starting to get kind of cold, so I took back what I had and put some on the fire. Now it's 1 to 2 in the morning, around 40 degrees with some light breeze. Nothing severe. I have two long sleeve shirts and an army surplus coat that is super warm, but my friends are in windbreakers and hoodies, and oh yeah, now it's raining. Off to get more wood. This time... I began taking into consideration that the type of wood that I would collect. There was a lot of pine, but that burns fast, which is why I had to go and collect it so often. The stretch of woods near the driveway was pretty much all pine. A few maples, but nothing big. I keep walking, knowing that this area has both conifers and deciduous trees in close proximity to each other. As I'm wondering, collecting wood... I notice that the rain has turned to a super fine snow. Time to head back, just in case it picks up. Then the whistling started again, a lot louder now. It's weird. There isn't any more wind than there was before. Maybe it changed directions. I keep walking. By now, I can hear the music from camp and pick up the pace just a little bit. Just as I summit the embankment and prepare to clamber down the other side, a loud noise echoes behind me. A tree fell. Shining my flashlight around, I could not see a single sign that that was the case and did not see a source. Maybe a deer knocked something over. In my head it does not matter because I'm back at camp anyway and I can try the marsh behind our shelter next time. Three in the morning? They were cold. The temperature now dropped to around 30 degrees, and the wind and snow had really picked up. Car blankets helped the boys a little bit, but they were not going to be able to sleep in a tent that I brought. Not without freezing. Except for R, who slept like a rock all night, after about 3.30. We decided to finish off our smoke and beer, and a good talking, 4.30 a.m. I'm about ready for bed at this point. I'm not too inebriated at all, but I was definitely pretty tired. I offer to go collect more wood before I retire to my zero-degree sleeping bag and cot. I camp comfy when I don't have to carry it far. They said they would join me. They must have been cold. We split up, and I end up heading back to where I was before, Except this time I left my flashlight on high and I made a bunch of noise to scare off that deer or whatever that was there earlier. I ended up a little further away from camp than I had intended because there were only pine branches on the ground. The whistling starts again. And this time I could tell the direction it was coming from. My left. And I shine my flashlight around that area before just returning to collecting wood. 
Then the sound stops briefly, picks up again in a different direction, less than a minute later, this time in front of me, and a little to the right, back into the pines. Maybe the branches of certain trees catch the wind just right and make that noise. So I think whatever and move on. Then, on my way back, the noise was following me, darting from left to right, but always sounding like right behind me. I didn't see anything, so whatever. Then the noise makes like one sharp whistle and pauses. Then I hear, it's cold out here. It was R, but I couldn't find him with my flashlight, so I called, where you at? And it sounded like he turned around because I heard a branch snap and a bit of movement. I pointed my flashlight at where the sound was coming from, and I did not see R anywhere. Maybe he's behind a bush or a tree or something. I call out again. No reply. He might be lost or something, because we weren't at camp, and he saw my flashlight moving, so he came to look. I asked again, where are you? Nothing. And then louder. I'm going to go back to camp. I thought he was trying to scare me. Shining my flashlight around one last time, I spot something dive into a bush about 40 feet from where I heard R turn around. I see you, big man. Grab some wood and come back. He's around six foot tall, about 250 pounds. I shine the light around for a few more seconds, then turn around again and start walking. The whistling is back. No matter what speed I moved at, it always seemed the same distance away. I decide that I just kind of sit under a tree and wait for R to pass by because he had to come back sometime. I saved battery of my flashlight, so I turned it off, closed one eye, so it would adjust faster. By now, the snow had picked up a really good bit, which is another good reason to stop, just in case R got lost. I couldn't really see far because there was a lot of cloud cover despite being a full moon. The whistling never got closer, but it did start to move around a little bit in a really odd circle. It would start in one spot, stop, then promptly start in another spot that was in a different direction. I realized that it had to be the wind or something because it was moving way too fast and moving at random. Cool. Now, where is R? I turn on my flashlight between whistles and call out to his name again. It's important to note here that the whistling never picked up while I looked around. It normally only stopped for a second or two, and it was super quiet. The snow was laying on the ground, and we had two to three in on the ground by now, so maybe that muffled it. Anyway, upon not hearing R, I thought that maybe I missed him, or did not hear him at all starting to head back to camp. As I stood up and brushed the dirt off my butt, I shined the flashlight around one more time and I was thinking in my head. I definitely heard him. After I stood up with the wood in my arms and began to walk back towards camp, I saw something move out of the corner of my eye. My flashlight, being a diving light, has a wrist mount that I was wearing, so I could use it and carry things. I turn towards and scan the area with my flashlight. Nothing. Not even four steps more, and I saw another movement. Now the whistling was back. It's annoying. It sounds like a fat guy who just ran up the stairs. Flashlight was on low, so I can only see maybe 40 feet around me. I didn't see anything, but I knew it was time to pick up the pace. The whistling was followed by flashes of movement, and I know it's not the wind. At this point, I'm speed walking. Being tall, I can move if I have to, and I was definitely traveling at jogging speed. R, a lumbering beast when he runs, could not move this fast or quietly through the woods. Another thing that it's not. I decided then to turn off the flashlight move into some brush that was close by. 
Not sure why, but I was getting a little weirded out. Had the shakes, even though I was warm. It was silent again. Well, whatever this is, is it hunting me? Is it a coyote? Not a coyote. There was a good period of silence, then more whistling. And this time, it wasn't circling around me, just moving around where I had turned off the flashlight. My eyes adjusted, and I peeked out from under the bush that I was rolled up under. Nothing. Just that whistling again. By this point, I was pretty much sober. Like if I got pulled over, I could nail the field sobriety test. I waited for a little while the thing just kind of looked around. Then I heard it speak. In a really gargled impression of me, it called out, Big man. It took everything I had not to panic. It's not R. It's not a human. Not a deer. Not the wind. Then it spoke again, saying R's name. Cutting off really strangely like you just lifted the needle off a record, but picking back up with Back to Camp. Still in a mimic version of my voice. My voice. I normally don't like hearing recordings of myself anyway, but now I really don't like them. It said a few more things in different voices that I did not recognize. All the voices were either talking about how cold it was, or questions like, What was that? Stop messing with me. But they all seemed like whoever was talking had some phlegm built up in their throat. Then it went quiet. I poked my head out of the bushes again, saw something sitting against a tree in the same position I had been in. Left leg straight out, right leg at an angle, hands behind my head. It could have fooled me as being R. We both kind of sit the same way, except his ADHD usually makes him fidget with his hands. Okay, so who's sitting in the woods with me? I lay there, silent. Just watch. It begins to whistle. So that's where it's coming from. It moves its hand around in a fist, out in front of it. The same way that I look around with my flashlight. Then begins to stand up. And it's tall. I only weigh 166. Skin and bone, mostly. So when I say that this thing was skinny, don't take it lightly. I can see how thin its long, spindly arms were silhouetted against the snow that coated a bush behind it. When it stood up, it was hunched over. Not sure if I was slouching when I stood up, but I certainly do slouch. It walked a few paces away from the tree and stood up the entire way. I worked with backdrops for theater productions, and the walls we use for most are around eight feet high, and this thing would have easily been able to see over one. I'm talking by at least by a foot. It slowly peers around, no hair on its head, and its side profile showed a super disfigured skull, the jaw hanging pretty far down, and there weren't really any lips that stuck out. But it was kind of hard to tell because of how dark it was. It let out one final R, big man, kind of like somebody with Tourette's would say, because they were just random and strung together. Then it let out this awful scream. My dad used to take me to air shows a lot as a kid, and this has been the same pitch and volume as an F-16. I couldn't move. It then peered down, around, head just seemingly sweeping the area. Then it crouches down again, leaps for a tree with the lowest branch, being around 15 feet, lands feet first on one of the branches, sits there, squatting, whistling, staring around, then disappears, faster than should be allowed in nature. I quickly count to ten in my head. The forest sleeps. I slowly make my way out from under the bush, begin to creep back towards camp, this time avoiding using my flashlight or making any noise if possible. I climb the embankment and take one last look towards the woods, unsure if that just happened or if I was asleep. I tumble down the other side of the embankment and return to relative safety of the big fire 
with Y and J, and the other two who went for wood. They had asked me where's my wood. Oh, it had a, it had bugs. It's fine. We got a lot anyway. They stacked up a solid pile of oak and pine. Not enough for the night, but enough for a little while. I asked where R was, and they pointed at the tent. He was passed out in there, snoring. I climbed into my sleeping bag, began to warm up a little bit. I was covered in snow, and then I heard that thing scream again off in the distance. Please don't tell me it's coming here. The other two looked at me wide-eyed. Normally, if I recognize a sound, I say what it is out loud, so they know what's up. To this, I had no response. They asked if I had heard the first one. Good. They heard it too. I answered with a nod as I unlocked the car in case we needed to book it. They asked if I saw it. I nodded. What was it? No clue. I described it to them quietly so that I could listen for more noises and told them about it imitating my voice. Y was now pretty freaked out and Jay thought I was BSing him, said it was some kind of owl. I got out of my sleeping bag, threw my coat back on, and joined them at the fire. For the first time in a while, I looked at my phone. It was now almost six in the morning. We looked up native owl calls and came up empty-handed. The same happened with every other animal we tried. Jay did seem a little nervous. I suggested that maybe it's a truck on the highway. He agreed that that's probably what it was. They didn't sleep. I forced sleep upon myself so that we wouldn't die on the car ride home. The next morning we went for a walk. It did not snow much after I got back, so you can kind of follow my footprints. The tree, the thing leapt into, was out of reach of me on Jay's shoulders. R was still asleep, but I think I might have been able to reach it if I was on his. The tree I sat under had scratch marks on it. I think they're from deer shedding the velvet off their antlers, but it creeped me out nonetheless. The tree it sat under had footprints everywhere. There seemed to be no order to them. It was amazing. It looked like it had run over every square inch of that area, coming as close to the bush as I was in two meter lengths. I don't really know much about cryptids or anything, but when I got home, I googled North American Tall Skinny Cryptid, and the second result was from Parade. A list of cryptids. After ruling out everything else in the list, I came across a picture of the Wendigo that has antlers. Not quite, but pretty close as described. Tall and skinny and super fast. I did research. Every picture has antlers, but I can't find any evidence that, other than a few movies, it had antlers. I don't know. What I saw definitely didn't have antlers, but it matched everything else, even down to the whistling. This was kind of long, but I'd appreciate any feedback. Thanks.